Bible gives us some principles by which we can test music. And number three, the Bible says that good Christian music emphasizes the melody. The melody. And uh, we read that in Ephesians 5, 19. We're to make melody in the heart to the Lord. We read that in Isaiah 23, 16. Make sweet melody. And in Isaiah 51, 3, the voice of thanksgiving and the voice of melody will be heard in the kingdom of God. Melody is the part of the music that you can hum. And it's a simple tune of the music. And that's what is to be emphasized in our Christian music. Not the rhythm, not uh, uh, some kind of strong uh, uh, rhythm that you can dance to, but simple melody. And the reason for that is that the most important part of Christian music is the message, the words, the lyrics, and what the words are saying and uh, whether or not they're conformed to the Word of God. And the simple melody is there just to reinforce those words and that message. And so the Bible emphasizes melody, which reminds us that when we talk about Christian music, the message of the music, what the music is saying, must match the message of the words, what the lyrics are saying. Sweet hour of prayer, beautiful melody that perfectly fits that message. A contemplative kind of little melody. Here's another example. It's a song about joy. Sing unto the Lord with joy. And it's a very happy little melody. Here's another example. So stand fast in the Lord. And that is more serious sounding melody, but it very much fits that message. Standing fast, it's strong, it's emphatic. And that's good Christian music. It's really as simple as that. And uh, so we, we have to learn how to think about music. And we're going to look at that a lot on Monday night and how to listen to music. But we want to deal with the fourth thing this morning about good Christian music. And that is that it is always Christ-centered. <laughs> Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always Christ-centered, our music. And uh, yet, when we come to contemporary Christian music, it's just opposite. And they would pretend it is Christ-centered, but in fact, it, it is man-centered, it is artist-centered, and it's all about them, and it's all about the music. And uh, it, of course, it's just like the world, they copy the world in every way, uh, but, but we see... On the covers of these magazines, on the covers of the albums, wherever you look, uh, that it's man-centered. You don't think about Christ when you see these things right. at all. You think about the artists and these people that are doing it and the foolish way that they're acting, the very worldly way that they're acting. It's all about man. Because they're copying the world. The music industry, industry in the world glorifies man. It's all about man. And, uh, and uh, countless testimonies have been given of young people that wanted to be a rock and roll musician so they could be a star. And, and so that people would uh, uh, look at them. And, and so people would pay attention to them. So they would be somebody. It's all about me. And the, the contemporary Christian musicians are simply following after that, we've got somebody like Michael W. Smith, big name, huge name in contemporary Christian music, and he's getting older now, but he used to be a real uh, pop star, real, uh, 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 he was a, what do you call it, he, he, the, the girls liked him, very affectionate toward him, but it's all about him. One of the concerts and how they just just literally worshiping him. It's all about man. It's not Christ's sin. 
The Bible also says that good Christian music flows from a submissive attitude. It's all of, the Christian life is all about submission. It's all about submitting to God first. Like the prodigal son said when he came to his senses, I've sinned against God. That's where the Christian life begins. And, and, and submitting to God and bowing my knees to God and desiring to go God's way and to be a disciple of Christ. But flowing from that is a submissive attitude toward authority in every direction that I look in this world because that's God's setup. Submitting yourselves one to another in this context in Ephesians chapter 5 where, where, where we read about spiritual songs and spiritual music. If we continue in that context, we read submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Submitting yourselves one to another. A submissive attitude. Wives, submit yourselves under your own husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. And so the Christian life is all about submission. And good Christian music is going to encourage that. It's going to feed that. It's going to be characterized by that. But when we come to contemporary Christian music, it's the very opposite. It's all about me. Which is why it causes rebellion and why it causes trouble in Christian homes. It's all about me, my right. My taste, my way. And, 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 and somebody else is not going to tell me what to do. That's what the, 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 the rock and roll's always been about, but that's what the contemporary music is all about. I don't care what my parents think. I don't care what my pastor thinks. He's an old fogey anyway. I don't care what those old fogies think. They're legalists. They're Pharisees anyway. And that whole attitude of me and my rights, that's what CCM is all about. Right. Hey, Pharisee, you're not going to tell me what kind of music I can listen to? Get a life. I've gotten so many emails from young people like that. What kind of attitude is that? To a preacher? It's all about rebellion. That's of the devil. But that's always been the theme song of rock and roll. The Animals, 1965, it's my life and I'll do what I want. It's my mind, I'll think what I want. That's been the philosophy of rock and roll from the beginning. Rolling Stones, 1965, I'm free to do what I want any old time. That's stupid, you're not. There's some big buildings in Chicago, go jump off of them. Well, you can also free to just splat on the sidewalk and it's the end of that journey. We're not free to do what we want any old time, but that's attitude of rock and roll. Mamas and Papas, 1965, you got to go where you want to go, do what you want to do. It's all about you. It's the very thing that reached into a Christian home when I was a kid and grabbed my heart, made a reb- help, help make a rebel out of me. There's something inside of his response to that. It's called the old flesh, the old Adam. We are rebellious by nature, and that music feeds that and encourages that. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. That's the very heart of rock and roll. And by its very sound, it's always rejected restraints and celebrated freedom, and particularly sexuality. That's been the theme song from the beginning. And that's why if you find an insubordinate, rebellious youth in a church, by the way, there's not enough young people here. 
But if you do, you'll find somebody that's hooked into worldly music. Invariably. Trace it, the link's going to be there somewhere. They're sneaking around listening to the world of music. If, if they're rebellious and they're chafing against authority, they're hooked into the world of music. Because that's what it's all about. A truly submissive spirit does not want to offend. I used to love to offend. Before I was saved, it delighted me to offend people. I enjoyed it. If I thought that some older person, some old person, was offended by my long hair, why, that could make my day. What, what foolishness. But the Bible says, It's good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. We are to care about offending people. We should want to be a blessing. And that's why I cut my hair. An old lady said she was offended by it when I was on visitation one night. And I said, I said ma'am, I'll cut it. I'm sorry, I offended you. It was exactly the opposite of the attitude I had a few months before that, before I was saved, where I, I would have told her to go jump in a lake and mind your own business. Whose hair is it anyway? That would have been my attitude before I was saved. But I, but I have a different attitude. Because the Christian life is, is about submission and, and it's about wanting not to offend. And so, good Christian music is intimately associated with a submissive spirit. That destroys contemporary Christian music. They could care less what we think. They know that we're deeply offended by it. They don't care at all. Number six, good Christian music is separate from the world. This is foundational. This, this one point alone destroys contemporary Christian music from a biblical standpoint. They say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about music. Oh, no, it says a lot. It says that we're to separate from the world. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children in light. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's the high standard of separation. But rather reprove them. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now here's a perfect definition of rock and roll. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Love not the world. That one verse destroys contemporary Christian music and its worldly philosophy and its worldly ways. They say we don't imitate the world. That's all they do. Well, then why do you always look like the world? Why do you always act like the world? Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, the enemy of God. We read in Romans 12, verse 2, Be not conformed to this world. Don't pattern yourself after the world. And all of its pride, and all of its lust, and all of its filthy and foolish ways. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world press us into its mold. Because the world is very proselytizing and aggressive. The world is not content to mind its own business. And the world presses in upon us. And so God says, resist it. Don't be conformed to it. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
and that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The way to avoid being conformed to the world is to be transformed by the Word of God and the renewing of the mind through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. But don't be conformed to the world. In one of the presentations tonight, why we reject CCM, we're going to see that contemporary music is unabashedly worldly. They glory in their worldliness even, which is in direct and flagrant rebellion to the Word of God. We wouldn't need anything else other than that if we cared about the truth. They say, well, love, you just don't have enough love there. Well, the Bible says that the love of God is to keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. To keep His commandments, that's the love of God. That's the definition of the love of God. To keep His commandments. They say, well, you don't have enough grace. But the Bible says the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. There's a world to come. And so we're to live and that world to come is going to be a righteous world. And we're to live in this present world as if we're already living in that next world. But we have the privilege as children of God, as born again believers in Christ, to live a righteous life in this present world of our own free will. We don't have a rod of iron hanging over our head as the world will have in the millennial kingdom. We have the privilege from the heart to live the, same, the righteous life that pleases God. To deny all of the evil things and the ungodliness and the worldly passions that come from our old flesh. And to do that is grace, is the outflow of, of true biblical grace in the Christian life. Grace is not license. Grace is not you can live as you please and born to be wild. Grace is holy, righteous living. What about liberty, they say? You just don't believe in liberty. You want to put everybody in bondage. But Paul said in Galatians 5 verse 3, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't use your liberty to an occasion to the flesh. If you use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, that's not biblical liberty. And so the Bible says that we are to separate from the world in all areas of our Christian life, certainly in the area of music. And what contemporary Christian music is, is the devil's chum, which is a fishing term, which is attracting fish through, through cornmeal or something that uh, they will attract fish up to your boat so you can catch them. And that's what contemporary Christian music is. And you've got a church, a traditional kind of church, uh, 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 that believes in separation from the world, and, uh, and, and then there's the world out there. But in between, there's the contemporary Christian music, which is simply the devil drawing young people particularly, but even older people, toward the world through this middle ground, supposedly. The devil's chum. One young person said, Before the Lord saved my soul, I slipped around behind my parents' backs and listened to contemporary Christian music. And that music softened me to the music that I would later come to listen to. The devil's chum. There's another point I want to make this morning. And that is that good Christian music creates vigilance. Spiritual vigilance and sobriety. Ephesians 5, the context that talks about spiritual music, says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, very carefully. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, 
See, a child of God can walk as a fool by living foolishly, carelessly. But be wise, but as wise. Not as fools, but as wise. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Vigilance, a sobriety, a watchfulness, a circumspectness in living so that we jealously guard what is, what is happening in our Christian lives. And we jealously guard what is happening in our homes. Oh, you know, those movies are innocent. They're Disney movies. Some of the, some of the most dangerous things you can buy for your kids or grandkids today is Disney garbage. No, we have to be keenly aware and vigilant and testing everything. And if it's coming from the world, we need to be suspect of it. Yes, Disney was an atheist. There's no church on Main Street in Disneyland. But there's churches on every Main Street in America. It was his vision of an America without God. You think that he's a safe man to receive entertainment from? These filthy-minded men, these God-hating men that make the entertainment today, that make the toys today, that make the fashions today, none of them are safe. That's right. We need to be keenly aware of that, 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 that we live in a world that they, these, men are, these people are enemies of God and they're enemies of righteousness and truth and we need to careful, be very careful, be ultra-careful about everything. That's not fanaticism, that's wisdom. The lack of that is foolishness. And I dare say that many multitudes of independent Baptists are foolish in the way they conduct their lives and the music they listen to and what they allow in the home and what, uh, what they allow on TV and what movies that they watch and, and what toys they buy for their grandkids. We need to walk as wise, not fools. We have a better way. We have wisdom. We have light. I grew up in Southern Baptist. I grew up in Southern Baptist. And I know what it's like to be around Christians that are fools and not wise. Preachers didn't warn. Preachers didn't warn about anything, hardly. They just let the people sort of go their way. When it came to Hollywood, when it came to entertainment, when it came to dress, when it came to a lot of these important things. And as a result, the people were just like sheep without a shepherd and they're just taking whatever the world's giving them. And it destroyed the kids. And it destroyed the grandkids. I thank God that he saved me when I was 23 years old and I knew enough never to go back to that kind of Christianity. But the fact is that the average independent Baptist today, church today is not any different than the Southern Baptist church I grew up in. But we must be different. These things are not optional. If we don't separate carefully from the world, if we don't walk in in great vigilance, then the, world, the, the devil will devour us. And he'll devour the next generation. Vigilance, sobriety. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. But when it comes to contemporary Christian music, it's all about Going with the flow and not being sober, not carefully testing everything. Just let it take over. And that music, it's all about creating these powerful feelings in the worshipers and uh, all about literally almost going into a trance. The the, the, the syncopation, 
the powerful syncopation induces that kind of trance so that you're not sober, so you're not thinking and testing the repetition, the constant repetition, the, the, um, the unresolving chords. We'll mention that this week. But, but, but the music itself in contemporary Christian music is all about the worshipers giving themselves over and not testing it. You're made guilty if you feel like you should test things and if you're resistant to anything. You're made to feel guilty. There's something wrong with you in those circles because you're, you're not with the program. You're, you're not going with the flow. I don't want to go with anybody's flow except God's. And the Bible says that the devil can appear to be God, that his, the devil's ab, uh, emissaries, the devil's angels can appear to be angels of light. I don't want to go with the devil's flow. I don't want to go with the flow of the flesh. So I've got to come to church with an open Bible, testing things, not just being swept along by powerful emotions. That's what the Word of God says. Be vigilant. And good Christian music is going to help you be vigilant. That's not what they want. The service, the, the big meeting I attended in 2000 in St. Louis, three to four hour evening services, but half of that's music, the, this powerful music sweeping the people on and building the people up in their emotions and crashing them down and, and, and all about manipulation. The contemporary Christian music. As a result, you have all these strange charismatic experiences going on, and they're clearly unscriptural. But the music's a big part of the preparation for that kind of thing. We want to mention number eight, and lastly this morning, that good Christian music is going to be doctrinally pure. And we need to be just as careful about the old hymns as we do about anything else. We need to test our music with the Word of God. Theologically precise. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 verse 3, don't allow any other doctrine, and that's true in our music. Don't allow any other doctrine in our music. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. But, but everything conformed to the word of Christ and the doctrinal purity. Good Christian music is understandable. Well, you've got to be able to understand the words if you're going to have doctrinal purity. The words, you need to understand them. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding also. I'll sing with the Spirit and I'll sing with the understanding also. Understandable. You say, well, of course it is. No. In contemporary Christian music, it's often not understandable. And you can't even understand the words. The music's so loud and so grinding and so weird. And, the, the, and, and, and many times, literally, the singer, so-called, is screaming in the microphone. And you can't understand what he's saying. It's not understandable, but it's filled with doctrinal error. Filled with it. Now, once in a while, in the old hymns, you'll find some doctrinal error. You know, we three kings of Orion are. What three kings? It doesn't say there's three kings. And there's some amillennialism that will, will come in there. And, uh, 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 but... With contemporary Christian music, it's filled with error. And often, often, the message is so vague, you don't know what they're saying. You could be saying anything. You might be saying about the devil. Stan Moser said that. But to be candid, I look at the majority, the majority of the music I hear today, and he's in the industry. And, I, and think it's virtually meaningless. That, that's what I've thought every time I've investigated this music and listened to the songs. 
And uh, when I wrote the book, Spot, uh, Contemporary Christian Music Under the Spotlight, I listened to hundreds of the songs, and, and that was constantly what I thought. That's virtually meaningless. Vagueness. Now this thing, if we played this, which we're not going to do, uh, live fast, fest in Oklahoma City in 2001, it was just, sounded like grinding industrial machinery, which is why they called it industrial, I guess. <laughs> and, and it's screaming in the microphone. That's a great message there. Well, what you usually have is a charismatic, anti-fundamentalistic, uh, ecumenical, judge-not message. And... They mock, they hate churches like this. And they mock us every chance they can get. Even those that probably don't know one ultra-time fundamentalist in their whole life. They still mock us. They can't get over us. John Michael Talbot warns about a fearful, excluding fundamentalism. It's fearful, excluding. Michael W. Smith, you're always going to have those very conservative... People, they say you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't smoke, you can't drink. It's a pretty bizarre way of thinking. In his, in his book, pretty bizarre way of thinking. Ecumenical. Bill Driscoll, I've felt in my heart for a long time that music was the power that God would use to transcend every denomination. But we don't want to transcend every denomination. Right. The Word of God doesn't allow us to do that. That, that. That's what this music's all about. That's one of the theme songs. And that's why they're comfortable with the Roman Catholic Church, with the Pope, with performing before the Pope. Many of them have done that. In Catholic settings, they never warn about the Catholic Church. Radical ecumenism, but also a blasphemous message. Just blasphemy. I believe it's blasphemy to talk about a Holy Ghost hop, jamming with the lamb, and calling Jesus JC, calling Jesus a rebel, a rebel, the biggest rebel to ever walk the earth. Jesus was not a rebel. He came to keep the law of God. He kept the law of God in our place. He wasn't a rebel. Calling God the king of soul. Old filthy soul music. He is not. Calling him the master of metal. Calling him the... Identifying Jesus Christ with... Filthy rock and roll. Jesus Christ rocks. That is blasphemy. It's blasphemy. You won't find them warning about that. That movement stands and falls together. Stands and falls together. It is a movement. I think many times the issue in our churches comes back to salvation. To salvation. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus this morning? That's what salvation is. It's not knowing about him. It's not knowing the Romans road. It's knowing him personally. Th that's what I ask people. They tell me, well, you know, I, 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 I wasn't saved for a long time. I had an empty profession of faith, and then, and then I got saved later. And I, I always say, you didn't know the Lord? Because that's salvation. Do you know Him? Jesus said to those uh, in Matthew chapter 7, depart from me, I, I never knew you. That's salvation. It's not a complicated thing. It's knowing Christ through repentance and faith. You sure you know him this morning? That's what changes lives. 
And that's what changes, that, that's what gives churches power. Personal relationship with Christ. Do you know him? We're living in a fierce battle. We're facing a fierce battle. And unless a church is standing against this hurricane of, of apostasy and compromise, it will be swept away. There's no neutral ground here. Pastor, would you come?